G'day. Uh, welcome to the Rocky Mountain uh, Annual Sprayer Clinic. Uh, my name is Craig Janalka, Product Specialist for Case IH. So today we're going to be covering some of the features uh, of the 4440 that we have here behind me, some maintenance tips, and along with some of the sprayer operation as well. So we're going to start um, with the front fill meter. So this is optional. So front fill flow meter on a Patriot 4440, as you're metering in water, this meter is counting up. Whatever value goes in this display automatically goes into the computer in the sprayer. We want to make sure that we initially have a calibration number in the display for this monitor to work. So the calibration, the calibration number that we have entered is on a fill flow meter that's located underneath the sprayer on the right hand side of the tank. So if you want to follow back with me and we'll, we'll see the location of it. <clears throat> so located underneath the machine, we have our fill flow meter right here. There is a tag on there to reference a ID number that needs to be entered into the display. So once we have that recorded into the display, now that monitor is going to work in conjunction with the fill flow meter. Okay, so we'll come back around to the front of the machine. Okay, we're going to go underneath the machine here. We're going to talk um, about the cab air filter. So because it's a sprayer, it is equipped with a charcoal filter. So the charcoal filter needs to be replaced yearly. And when I say yearly, preferably in the spring. Uh, so if you're, getting, if you're getting maintenance work done um, to your sprayer, ask the dealership to leave the charcoal filter in its bag sealed up and then put it in in the spring. So the charcoal filter from parts comes in a sealed bag. And if you, once you open that bag, the charcoal starts to release so then you're taking some of the life out of your out of your filter. So location for that, we do not draw air from the bottom, we draw air from the top of the cab. So it's clean air that we're drawing, but the charcoal is going to help eliminate any particular matters, uh, spray drip that, that may occur. If we reference along to the right hand side here, so sit it in the seat, I'm going to reference right and left hand side. So looking at the fuel filter location here. Okay, so I have a primer and a bleed location down on this filter. And there's a secondary bleed location in the engine compartment on the fuel filter up in the in the engine compartment. Okay, so normally if I change the filter here, all I have to do is open that bleed screw, pump it up, fill the fill the filter, and we're good. The other thing, we have a water, a f water and fuel indicator. So it's as simple as taking the plug off of here, cracking that a quarter turn, and if there's any water in, in your fuel that gets into it, you can drain that. There is a light in the cab that will indicate that you have uh, water in your, in your uh, fuel. Also, while we're here, I'm going to point out the DEF module. So located in the DEF module, we've got a thimble filter located in line in the pump. This is recommended at 1800 hour interval change. And then we have another filter located on the bottom part of the DEF module that is 3600 hours. Okay. Both of these filters, I would highly recommend getting them serviced by your dealer, um, by Rocky Mountain Service Team so that they can reset any, any of the issues that may occur when they're changing the filters. Okay. The other thing we'll talk about is these two hooks here. Hey, they, ca they can be used um, in, in pulling the machine out. I just caution, caution that uh, we want to pull from the back. Once we get to the back, I'll, I'll point out the location that we would like to tow on in that location. I'm going to draw your attention now to the trailing link suspension. So there's five grease nipples on the front that we want to grease daily. So there's two 
two grease nipples located here on the trailing link or knee joint suspension. Then we have three grease nipples located on the spindle. So we want to make sure that those are daily greasers. So we got five on the right hand side and five on the left hand side of the machine. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about the trailing links design. So what we have here is we have a cylinder, hydraulic cylinder within a spring. So as I am driving, if I am climbing a hill, if I have any type of slippage, what's going to happen is I'm going to supply oil automatically to the, to the active suspension. I'm going to squat the front end of the machine down, weight transfer is going to occur, and then I'm going to climb that obstacle or that hill for us. So that's, that's the design in, intent of having the hydraulic cylinder inside the coil and this will only be on the front two corners of your machine. Another service points are on the steering cylinders. So I have two grease nipples. I have one on the outboard and I have one on the inboard as well. I want to grease those daily as well. So both the right hand side and the left hand side we want to grease those two grease nipples. If I want to set my steering width okay i can adjust from 120 to 157 inches all i have to do here is loosen this bolt off there's a little teardrop on there i can position that there's numbers located on the slide axle that show me the the distance that i go once i set that in there there's a switch in the cab which we'll show later on on how to adjust the axles and all four axles are going to slide out at the same time with one switch. Okay. From there, we'll go around to the left hand side of the machine. And we're going to talk about the fill station. So located on the located on the left hand side of the machine, we've got the, the fill station that we call it. Um, so our, our primary slogan is grade a spray. So all of the valve correlations that I have that are indicated with a gray mark, okay, give me the give me the optimal settings that I can do, whether I'm onboarding product into the machine or I'm spraying. Secondly, we have an emergency stop located on the fill station, okay? If this button is accidentally pushed in or in an event of emergency, if I'm filling the machine and I happen to blow a product line and I want to shut my machine off, all I have to do that, that'll kill the machine. I have to remember, though, to pull that back out or the machine will not start for me, okay? It'll crank, but it will not start. Now we have, we have S1 switch, S2 switch. Okay, so the S1 switch activates the service light. Okay, so that service light will come on. Once S1 is activated, now the machine will not move. Okay, so it's a built-in safety feature saying that I am working in this area. If there was an operator in the cab, he will not be able to move this machine. He can, he can move the hydro handle and he will not move it, okay? The second switch, S2, turns my pump on, okay? It goes to a manual mode, and my third switch is RPM, okay? So now utilizing that pump, I can perform agitation or equipped with suction quick fill, I can onboard with the product pump of the sprayer, I can onboard the machine, okay? So we wanna make sure that S2, one and S2 are turned off when we're done prior to going into the machine. Otherwise, it's a trip down the ladder to shut S1 and S2 off so I can move the sprayer again. Okay. We have a hand wash station here. There's two filling. There's a fill spot on the top as well. You can fill at the bottom. You can buy yourself a quick adapter uh, for a garden hose here. It, it'll thread in here. You can open up the valve, 
push water into that tank. You don't have to climb up with a bucket of water and fill that tank. So you can fill it from below um, on, the, on the fill station as well. So when I'm filling from the side, open up the valve and I'm onboarding product going into the machine. So we'll talk a little bit about if I have a situation where I can't build pressure. Okay? So this machine is equipped with a suction quick fill that allows me to use the product pump of the sprayer to onboard product. Okay? So if I am using this feature, I have the suction quick fill opened. Okay? I onboard my product, I get back into my sprayer, and I can't build pressure. Okay? The first thing you want to check is to make sure the suction quick fill is turned off. If that is left open, the product is just going to bypass and you're not going to build any pressure. Okay? So you want to make sure that the suction quick fill is off in the spraying mode. The other thing, if, I am, if I'm spraying in the field and I happen to blow a product line. Okay? So we have product delivery lines with our chemical and water throughout the, the sprayer, the booms. If I blow, blow a product line, the first thing I need to remember to do is turn the key off, come down here, and I want to shut the sump valve. Once I shut the sump valve, the flow of product will stop going to the booms. Okay? However, if I am uh, half or fuller of a tank, a product in my tank, we have a manual agitation or sparge valve. Okay? If product is still coming out of the lines, what I then need to do is I need to take and I need to shut my manual sparge valve off or agitation valve off along with my main sump and that will totally stop the product from flowing out. Then you can make your repairs to the product line. Okay? And once your repairs are made to the product line, then you open up your sump valve, open up your sparge valve, your manual sparge valve, and when we do the sprayer controls inside, we do have an electric sparge valve or agitation that, that we can set up in the machine. Okay. The other thing we'll note is we've got two power points okay, on the machine. And it's exactly what I mentioned. They are power points. There's a fuse located in the battery box that if I happen to try to jump start it, or, or give it a quick boost, I could possibly blow that fuse on the other side in the battery box. These two ports are designed for auxiliary power for a chem pump. Okay? Some have tried. Sometimes you'll get away with not blowing the fuse, but if you happen to not be able to start your machine, the fuse is blown in the battery box on the right-hand side. That'll need to be changed. So. It's, it's easy access to, but try to get into habit if you're going to jump start or boost the machine to boost on the battery itself. Okay. So axle slides. So we've, I mentioned earlier that we can adjust our axles from 157 inches to 120 inches. We want to make sure that we do this when the tank is empty, when we make the axle slide adjustment, and we do not want to grease the axle tube side itself. Dry graphite is the preferable lubricant. Okay, so same thing when we're moving the slides in. If we happen to be early spring where there's mud conditions, might want to come back and just have a double check and see. Get that off of there. It'll in increase the life of the axle slides on the machine. From there, we're gonna we're gonna go to the final drives. When I purchase a new sprayer, okay, we, from factory, we put break-in oil into the power hubs, okay? So we want to make sure that we change the fluid in the, in the power hubs at 50 hours, okay? So we have our CNH branded oil. So that's the lubricant that we're going to use in there, 85140. Takes about a liter a liter, 1.1 liters to fill the torque hubs. Okay. I get 
often questions that it's a, it's a two-man job or more um, because you have to line up to make sure that this plug is located level to fill. There's an external snap ring. All you need is, is two screwdrivers. You pop that snap ring off, pull the cover off. There's a thrust washer in behind there. And now you can have all four corners of your machine draining the oil. Now I can reposition that torque hub so that my fill plug, level plug, is level with the machine and I can now add, add my oil to the machine. If you're running um, from factory, we're 620s, if you're running a bigger tire on there, um, 710 or something like that, I would highly recommend that you change oil twice a, twice a season on the power hubs. Okay? Like I said, it's 1.1 liters. It's not cooled. It is a small amount of oil, so it's a good habit to, to do two, two oil changes a year. But for sure, on a brand new machine, I want to change that first 50 hours and get that break in oil out of the machine and then put my 85-140 back into the machine. Okay. The other thing we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about the gear increaser. So we have 75-90 oil for the gear increaser. So we have done some changes um, for model year 21. So we just got to note that, that there is a sight glass on the back for the gear increaser. Prior to that, you used to have to fill the gear increaser with the breather port on there. Model year 21, we've, we've changed the design. Now I can fill through the, through the port there and it makes it a lot more easy accessible to fill the, the gear increaser on there. Okay, so that's our oil that we're gonna use for the gear increaser. Hydraulic oil. So um, we've, we've now changed to a hydro HV46 oil. Um, prior to that, we were using ex excavator oil. Either or is fine. Um, if you have excavator oil, you can continue to use excavator oil in your hydraulic systems. The two oils are compatible. Okay, So if you happen to run out of excavator oil, um, then you would have to utilize the HB46. To do my hydraulic oil changes or top-offs, on top of the on top of the um, when I access the two doors, the clamshell doors, my hydraulic tank is located in the back. There's a little port on the top that I need to put, pour the oil into that port. And the reason why I'm doing that is that the oil goes through the filter, so we're putting filtered oil into the machine, and I know it takes a little bit more time but at least we're putting clean filtered oil back into the machine and, and creating that. So again, that filter on the top, I recommend a seasonal change. And then if we look back on the hydros, I've got two filters on either side, high pressure for the filters. I recommend changing those yearly as well. Greasing points, so again, Anything located on the parallel lift arms, anything on the suspension, on the pivots, we want to make sure that we do daily greasing on those points as well. Okay, so we're going to walk down the boom here. And we're going a long ways out. If you can notice, this is our 135 foot boom that we have on the machine. It's an all aluminum construction. So the breakaway may look different to you than if you're running a 100 foot or a 120 foot. The breakaway is different on our aluminum boom. What I want to point out on the breakaway on the Millennium boom, which is only in the 135 foot model, is this roll pin. Um, I want to make sure that that roll pin is in that location. 
if I see that roll pin is missing, um, I need to replace that dampener, okay? Once that roll pin falls out of there, then the cushion effect in that dampener no, is no longer effective. So I wanna make sure that if I'm doing my greasing, it's an easy check that I'm gonna go and check both sides front and back because I have two dampeners on either side of the machine. So as we go out to the end of the boom, um, we'll notice we'll notice a dampener on this side as well. So again, I wanna check that roll pin location in there. We also have a spring assist in conjunction with the, the two struts that we have on the breakaway system. So the machine breaks away similar to the 120. So we're either forward or we're, or we're back in there. On the 120 foot machines with the breakaway, we have a, a spring breakaway assembly like this. Okay? Sometimes I get some complaints or concerns, if especially desiccating, if I'm in wheat and if I happen to hit something, I break away. My, what, what happens is my spring expands and then I grab a bunch of crop in there and now I could have a couple things not happening. Either I'm gonna be, three of my nozzles are not gonna be effective spray or how it's positioned on the 120, sometimes my auto boom sensor is affected by that. So I have to get out of the machine, pull that material out of there. Okay. I tell guys, take a piece of rubber hose slid it down the center, wrap it around the spring, and then tie strap it. That way that spring can expand and contract and not catch any material inside that spring, okay? We don't see, the, we don't see that on the, on the 135 foot boom um, because of the location of the spring. Where the location of the spring is more on top where it's closer to the crop on the 120 and 100 foot booms. We're gonna talk about auto boom now. So our auto boom is our, our auto boom height. So prior to modeling your 20, we use what we call an ultrasonic sensor, okay? So you'll be more familiar if you have a model year 19 and later with this design, okay? So this is using ultrasonics. In model year 20, we went to a radar sensor or XRT. So in setting up auto boom with the ultrasonics, so model year 19 and, and older, we have speed, sensitivity, and stability, okay? So speed is how fast the boom goes back into the crop. Sensitivity is how fast my boom reacts up, okay? So, there's no magic number that you can have that is gonna be one and done because everybody's driving habits, everybody's speed is different, okay? So we can get some starting points on there. Um, I like to see usually 10 and 15 for speed, or for speed, 10, 15 for stability, and then sensitivity, um, or sensitivity, sorry, at 15, and then stability, I like to set stability just that I'm sitting in there on either on a 120 foot boom that my booms are just pulsating up and down just a little bit, okay? That's usually good for a speed around 15 to 18 miles an hour, okay? So you'll have to tweak those to get your auto boom utilizing the ultrasonic sensors working properly. You'll have to tweak those numbers as you drive with it. But Remember, you don't want to have your speed number higher than your sensitivity because your, your boom is going to always want to be reacting up and down, and then that's when you get into a boom that is unstable. Okay? Model year 20, as I said, we went to XRT. We went to a radar sensor. We've simplified the process with this, with this sensor. I took this sensor off for for ease of clarification, but it would be mounted in this position like this on the machine. And on a 135 foot boom, there could be seven of these. On 125, there could be up to five, okay? We've simplified it. 
we have one setting now, sensitivity um, on 135 foot machine, seven sensors, our sensitivity, we can run about 50% on there and that'll give us good boom stability. Okay, as we move along down, we're gonna talk a little bit about NCVs. So these are what we call the nozzle control valve or NCV. Each one of these NCVs have a little LED on them that indicates a status whether it is working or not. So as you can see, these are flashing green. So in the flashing green status means we're good to go. In your operator's manual, there is a matrix of the lights, how they flash, that can alert you to particular situations or, or problems. Okay, so in the event that um, I need to change an NCV or service the NCV, <clears throat> it's easy, unplug it. But when I unplug it, I wanna make sure that I take this harness and I locate it on the back away from it. Because they have a tendency, um, when they're warm, they have a tendency to, to, to lay underneath the, the wet boom and when I have this connection taken apart, it could drip into the connector, okay? So I wanna get into the habit of taking this connector and getting it out of the way of any product that's gonna come, come out of there, okay? What I wanna do, <clears throat> what I wanna do at that point is I have the NCV off, okay? And say my tip is dripping, so with each sprayer, there's two of these little wrenches in there, okay? This one is to disconnect the spanner nut on there, just like that, okay? Or tighten it. Okay, that's as easy as that. The other end of it fits into four slots in the actual NCV or nozzle control valve. I loosen that off and I take it apart, okay? And inside here is a poppet, we call it, okay? So quite possibly there might have been a, some material for material that got into this and kept it off its seat and was dripping out of here. If I find debris in there, all I simply have to do is clean it, flush it out, <clears throat> make sure there's no debris on the inside of that, put it back together and put it back on my sh machine. Okay. We say, and there's lots, there's a few variables to it. The life of the poppet really depends on what product you're spraying. If you're spraying lots of granular or high pressure, these poppets will wear out quicker. Okay. So roughly about 1500 um, hours is, is where you'll start to see some poppets that are gonna be donut shaped in there and could cause it to leak. So rule of thumb is for myself, if I see that my tip is dripping, I know either I've gotta replace this poppet and I can simply just replace this poppet, I either replace this poppet or like I said, maybe a piece of material got in there and <clears throat> is keeping that poppet off the seat and I'm leaking past. We want to note that since we, since we introduced Ink Command Flex, which was model year 17, that we had two different styles of NCVs. We have a Wilger, which this sprayer is equipped with, and then we also have an Airag NCV or nozzle body. Okay? So the, the nut size and the insert that goes into the nozzle body are different on those. So for convenience, we have marked a W on the NCV or an A. So if I have a Wilger nozzle body like this one, I'm gonna use a Wilger NCV. If I have the Case IH air egg on there, I'm gonna use an air egg NCV, which is gonna, like I said, have a bigger nut here and the internal bore is different where it threads into. All right, so we'll continue on down the boom here.
and we're going to talk about autofold. So all of our all of our equipment is is um, built with autofold plus or easy fold. So autofold plus on our 125 foot machines and 135 foot machines, it's a one button press and hold. Once calibrated, my booms are going to unfold. Okay. When I'm done spraying that field, again, it's a one touch and I fold my machine in, my booms fold in and cradle. What I look for sometimes if my auto fold is not working, instead of a phone call to the service department, maybe I was in a field that was, that was too early to go in, mud conditions, depending on where your tire tracks are spaced out, Sometimes mud will build up in these areas, and if these potentiometer linkages don't move freely, your autofold will not work. Okay? So it's a good idea to check the linkages in both locations so that your autofold is working. If those are clear, um, then your autofold is going to work for you. Okay? So double check that, might save you a, a phone call or a service call out, out to your sprayer. Okay, so on the back of the machine is our, is our PC2 or our product control node 2. This is the brains of the pulse width system. Okay, so the, the pulsing nozzle. This particular model with Aim Command Flex, there's a bank of fuses back in here that control the spray system. Okay, so if we have a situation, we want to check these fuses first off cut the tie strap, undo it, and check the fuses in there to make sure that they're good. If we find a failed fuse, we can simply put that fuse back in and, and away we go. Okay. Also, on the product control node two, in conjunction with our remote diagnostic that we have, um, in model year 20, we started shipping the sprayers with this handheld remote. What this handheld remote does is it does sections for me or it does individual nozzles. So on the startup in the morning, <clears throat> I can turn my pump on and then I can go through and I can check each nozzle to ensure that my spray pattern is working and fine. If I find where I have a possibly a plug tip, I can shut the pump off, remove the tip, clean it up, service it, put it back on and then I can restart my pump and then check and make sure that my spray pattern is done. And I can go through all 82 nozzles. So on a 135 foot machine, I've got 82 nozzles, okay? In order for this to work, there's a pairing procedure. So there is a, a code, once I, once I check off remote diagnostics, there's a code in the display that I have to enter into this handheld device and the communication is Bluetooth to it, okay? If I come to the back of the machine and I go to, to sync this and I forget to take that code off of the display, the last four digits on the serial number of the product control node two is my code for my remote, okay? So no, don't necessarily have to go back into the machine. You can just grab the last four digits and I can I can sequence this and program it so that I can check my nozzles every morning. If I'm changing products over, I can, I can easily check this out. There's a holder location in the sprayer where this goes. So we're gonna talk about filters now. So on a 120 or 135 foot machine, we're gonna have three primary filters, okay? With AIM Command Flex, we always utilize 80 mesh filters, okay? So why we utilize 80 mesh filters is we say whatever flows through 80 mesh screen will flow through the poppet of the NCV. So that's why we use it. From factory, they come with 50 mesh, okay? So they're usually switched out at the dealership during PDI. When I do a clean out, I change products. What I want you to do or recommend is to unscrew this 
connection here, remove the whole housing and clean it out. Don't just open up this <clears throat> bottom screw. Sediment tends to build in this area in here. And if I, if I don't fully take this filter cover off, I have the potential for chemical residue in there and I have the potential for burn. So I want you to take this, all these filter housings off, clean them properly when you do a switch over. In saying that, please have a stock of O-rings for these banjo filter housings because they tend to grow depending on the chemical and a lot of times we shortcut it because we don't have the proper O-ring and we know that that O-ring is hard because it swells and it's hard to put back in there, okay? So a, a, part of, a part of your spring thing is make sure that you have enough O-rings that when you're doing product changeover that you can put a new O-ring, clean your filter out, clean your canister out properly so that you do not have no burn or, or residue. Okay. Talk a little bit about the, the stability of our boom. <clears throat> we, uh, we, tend to, we tend to really talk about stability and how we achieve that is we have a two frame rack system. So we have a main frame attached to the parallel lift arms and then we have a secondary rack system that allows the boom to go side to side because our virtual center point or pivot point is about three feet up from the top of that boom, okay? So when you have a higher center point, your boom tends to float back and forth versus side to side and getting real whip on your boom. So we, with this design, we have a really stable boom design on here. I'm gonna draw your attention to these flag bolt pins. And we've done some work to these. So these flag bolt pins have a tendency um, to loosen off. What you can do with that is you can take and you can put a longer bolt in there, double nut it and lock tight it and those bolts will, will, never, will never come out again on you. So that's a quick, easy step that you can do to, to avoid that. All right, so we'll walk down this boom side So I, I, when I talked about the filters and I talked about um, clean out and stuff, we also want to remember that we have boom flush valves located on each end of the booms. And we've done several updates to these boom flush valves and we've made them a longer handle and we've made them that you can visually, visually know whether they're open or closed because of that and they're a lot easier that we've to open and close than we have in the past. Okay, so with winterization, we'll talk winterization now. What we sometimes fail to do in winterization is we fail to winterize our fentro nozzles. Okay? It's important that we winterize our fentro nozzles because what happens most times is this little solenoid here, which is roughly around $700 to $1,000 if, there's, if we do not winterize our fentanyl nozzles, this little solenoid could crack. Okay. So in winterizing, we wanna make sure that we use at least 50 gallons of, of RV or sprayer antifreeze, because it takes 30 gallons to fill the plumbing system. So we wanna ensure that we use ample um, winterization fluid. We wanna make sure that we winterize our fentanyl nozzles and when we do the winterization, we want to again lift our booms all the way up, open our, our boom flush valves, which I have one located on each end of the boom structure. Then I want to tip my boom tips all the way down, let that product drain out of there, and then vice versa, I want to tip them up so all the product flows out of, out of the system.
in keeping with the winterization process, the other thing I want to do once I've once I have have sprayed out all of the the sprayer antifreeze, I want to make sure that I loosen the set screw or the plug on the pump, and I want to drain the pump out too. So I want to have no no winterization fluid in the machine left over. I want the booms empty, the tank empty, and I want to make sure I take this plug out of here so that I drain my pump fully so that I don't cause any problems with it freezing up. Okay, so here's our battery box location. So like I said, inside the battery box, so there's two latches on there. <coughs> inside our battery box okay we go in here and here's our 60 amp real uh, fuse that's okay was located on the other side that's the one that if you boost on you could possibly possibly pop that fuse in there oh if we look up in the engine compartment there there's the fuel filter secondary fuel filter location and that's the other location that I talked earlier about, that there's a bleed screw on top of that one as well. Next, I wanna talk about our product flow meter. Just like the front fill flow meter option, okay, there is a calibration tag number on there as well. It is a good idea to write that calibration number down somewhere, have it handy for you, that if you ever had an issue with with the having to know where that number is, uh, what happens is quite often these tags disappear after about a year after some washing, they're gone. So if I lose that tag number, if I don't have it recorded down there, then I'm going to have to do a catch test. I'm going to have to go each nozzle boom, catch the product coming out of it for a meter time so I can achieve that cal number on there so my gallons match my acre sprayed. And lastly, <clears throat> on the machine there's four of these springs. Okay? There's two on the left hand side and there's these two on the right hand side. For proper tank um, holding, we want to make sure that this spring length is 92 millimeters on there. So another thing we can check to make sure our, our tank is secured and has has a little bit of, of give in there that it's not rigidly mounted. Okay so now we're going to go into the cab and we're going to touch on cab controls and operation. Okay, so my little handheld remote device that I had for checking my nozzles. Um, we have a, a quick storage location for it here. Um, I'll be mounted up in, into this location in there. So, cabin controls. So, we'll go through the hydro handle first. So, we have left boom tip up down, right boom tip up down, auto guidance engage. Our center button is our master spray button. If we go up to the right hand console now, I have infinite speed control. So what infinite speed control is, it is a variable potentiometer so that if I have my speed set at 18 miles an hour on my infinite speed control, I can fully move my hydro handle forward and now I'm using this speed pot to control my speed. Where I use this speed control pot is when I'm coming into a situation where I want to have increased torque. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use my speed control to dial back, which is going to give me a quicker response for more torque than physically pulling back on the hydro handle in there. 
Next located to that is my boom rack. So my master, master, my main boom rack up and down. So that's going to lift the whole spray boom up or down. If I single pulse down, my boom height is my boom rack is going to go down to my working height. If I double tap up, it's going to raise the machine all the way up to the maximum working height. I got seven switches located here as well. So these control my boom sections. So it's on a 120 foot or a 135 foot machine, I have seven sections. So if I wanted to shut off a section, I would simply shut these off. Normal spraying operation, those switches are always on. Okay. Down below that, I have fence row nozzles. So I got my left or right fence row nozzle. Then beside that, I've got a manual tip fold. Okay, left and right for the outer tips. For the inner tips, I'm utilizing my, my buttons, my up and down buttons on there. In the center of that is my auto fold switch. Okay. So I simply hold my auto fold switch. When I'm racking up, the booms come up and everything comes in and then they sit in the cradle. Opposite to that, they lift out of the cradle and then they're down again. I have my agitation switch that we talked about before. It's located here and right beside that is a master power switch. So again, if this master power switch is not on, my monitor won't light up or my sprayer won't start. So again, make sure that master power switch is on first. And a good indication is I will not have my spray screen or my universal terminal or UT present on the display if this switch is off. So that'll save you a service call or phone call. Make sure that master switch is on and then I have park brake as well. So with my park brake, I want to make sure that when I disengage my park brake, I want to increase my throttle to about 13 to 1500 RPM before I move the machine. Okay. It's important that I do that because the charge pressure on the brakes release properly. And a good indication of that it's working is that the access ladder will raise all the way up. If I find I have a saggy ladder, I know that my charge pressure is probably lower. I can throttle up a little bit more. If that ladder does not come all the way up, probably a good idea to phone, phone the dealership and make sure that we do, we do a charge pressure so we know that when I disengage the brakes, that the brakes are actually coming off. Okay. The other thing is on our foot pedal, we have service brakes, okay? If I touch these service brakes and I'm driving, it, the sprayer automatically comes to a stop, okay? So what we wanna not do is not use these brakes, the brake pedal, if we can possibly not to. It disengages the hydros, puts everything into a neutral state, and you come to an emergency stop. If I have to use that pedal, what I'm going to have to do to, re, to reinitiate the drive sequence on the sprayer is normally I'm going to be ahead. I'm going to have to bring my hydro back to neutral. Okay. Once I bring my hydro back to neutral, then I'll be able to drive the machine again. As far as, as far as like GPS and guidance wandering, it's a good habit to phase the steering cylinder so there's no it's all hydraulics there's no there's no fixed link so phasing the steering cylinder should be done daily and simply what I do there start the machine up with up the, with the machine at operating temperature I want to take and I want to take my steering wheel and I want to turn fully to the right and hold it for a couple seconds then go fully to the left hold it for a couple seconds and come back to neutral and that's going to phase or center my steering cylinders so that we're operational. Okay. 
with the nozzle settings so when we change over from a different nozzle so on the on the machine now we currently have a red or an 04 nozzle if we switch nozzles to an 06 we're going to walk through the screen that we want to go through so we're going to tap on the gears in the ut screen and then we're going to go to the gear and the nozzle symbol okay and that's going to take us into a calibration summary page and now we see ncv tip size so i was spraying with an 04 now i'm going to switch to an 06 i simply tap on that and i have a scroll chart on there so maybe i'm going to use an 05 maybe i'm going to use an 08 depending on on what i'm going to be spraying i'm going to be desiccating so i'm going to go with an 08 i'm going to press on 08 then i'm going to use this green arrow and go back and now all of my ncv or all of my tip size is set properly and now i'm going to make sure that i apply the proper rate so now i know i'm going to have the proper rate that i'm going to be spraying out okay so with that that concludes the the sprayer walk around so wishing everybody a, a happy prosper 2021 and safe and secure thank you